Hi there, my name is Dr. Elsie Wynn. I'm an Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Toronto. It's a pleasure to be here. Today I'll be speaking about chest CT patterns of interstitial lung disease. I hope to provide an approach to looking at chest CTs and recognizing the patterns of interstitial lung disease. I'll provide you with five guiding principles that will help you in your journey to identify these chest CT patterns. So even though this is a talk focused on interstitial lung disease, there are often associated airway abnormalities. So the alveolar uh, air spaces as well as the interstitium is often uh, are both often involved. Take for example, pulmonary edema, where you can often see fluid in the alveolar air spaces as well as the interstitium. So here's my approach. First, look at the attenuation and notice if there are any areas of increased attenuation, namely consolidation and ground glass opacity. By definition, ground glass opacity is increased lung attenuation that does not obscure the underlying vascular anatomy. So notice in this case, you can still see uh, increased density, but also the vessels through it. In contrast, consolidation is increased lung attenuation where the underlying vascular anatomy is obscured. And some examples are shown here with some nodular consolidation in the right lower lobe where the edges of the vessel are not uh, defined anymore. Next, um, I'll speak about areas of decreased lung attenuation and focusing on air trapping and cysts and then also reticulation, which is basically too many lines. And these can be seen in infectious and inflammatory conditions, as well as fibrotic interstitial lung disease, and also diffuse lymphogenic carcinomatosis. Then we'll touch upon nodules and focus on uh, the distribution of these nodules, random, centrilobular, and perilymphatic. So let's look at this first case. There's diffuse bilateral ground glass opacity and airspace consolidation. Also some scattered interlocutor septal lines here immediately in the right lung. So how do we approach this case? I find it very helpful to try and decide, is it an acute or chronic process? So how do you do that? Well, compare with priors, if available, check the provided history. You may have to go into the electronic patient record, and sometimes I do this to get a little bit more information, or talk to the requesting physician. Sometimes findings are combined. Here you can see a case of consolidation in the lower lung zones with some air bronchograms. Notice how you no longer see the vessels through it. But also in the right middle lobe and lingular segment, you see increased lung density with interlobular septal thickening. And when you see ground glass density with interlobular septal thickening, it's a pattern we call crazy paving pattern. And notice on the coronal reconstruction, we also see nicely demonstrated these interlobular septal lines. And these would be the curly B equivalents that you see on chest radiographs. This was a case of COVID-19 pneumonia. So let's see if you've processed some of this information already. This is a case of a 34 year old man who went to an indoor house party and then developed fever, dry cough and mild shortness of breath five days later. What is the pattern of abnormality? I'll give you a few moments and here's the coronal reconstruction which shows similar findings. So of course, this is a case of ground glass opacity and also a case of COVID-19 pneumonia. In the early stages, we often see these peripheral, sometimes nodular ground glass densities favoring the lower lung zones. So let's move on to air trapping and cysts. In this particular case where you see heterogeneous lung density, so-called mosaic attenuation or heterogeneous lung attenuation, I find it very helpful to focus on the more lucent or lower density lung. And ask yourself if the blood vessels here appear fewer and smaller than the remaining lung. And I think they do. There seems to be a paucity of vascular density in the more lucent lung. And that raises the possibility of mosaic perfusion. And in this case, I think it's secondary to underlying air trapping. And the reason I say that is because there are other associated airway anomalies or abnormalities, namely some mild bronchiectasis that we see here, as well as mild mucus plugging. <laughs> 
such as in the posterior right upper lobe. Now you might ask yourself, well, why would an airway abnormality cause abnormality in perfusion? And this is because in areas of chronic gas trapping or air trapping, those areas of lung are not participating normally in gas exchange. So the body starts to reduce blood flow to those areas of chronically gas trapped lung. You get what we call reflex vasoconstriction. So the blood vessels over time start to get smaller in areas of chronic gas trapping. This was a case of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, which is a manifestation of graft versus host disease in a patient post bone marrow transplant. And notice how we can suspect gas trapping even on an inspiratory view. If you look at the trachea here, it's convex posteriorly, indicating the patient was uh, imaged during an inspiration. On an expiratory view, you would expect the trachea to become like a frown, as we see here. And so expiration scanning is extremely useful to confirm gas trapping. It may not be done routinely at your institution for all chest CTs, but it is very helpful to confirm the gas trapping, which becomes progressively loosened or more conspicuously loosened uh, when gas trapping is present. And this is a case of hot top lung. So normal or even ground glass density lung becomes more dense or wider on expiration scanning, whereas the gas trap lungs remains loosened or becomes progressively more conspicuously loosened. So let's test your knowledge on detection of gas trapping. Do you think uh, air trapping is present in this case? And I will say the expiration scan was done with a good expiratory effort. There's also a little bit of pneumomediastinum uh, seen here and also anteriorly. I'll give you a few moments. So yes, there is gas trapping here. And as a reminder, the uh, areas of normal lung or even ground glass opacity lung become progressively dense on expiration scanning, whereas the gas trap lungs remains loosened or even progressively more loosened. So let's briefly talk about some cystic lung disease conditions. And here I present pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, lymphangiomyomatosis, abbreviated as LAM, uh, LIP is lymphocytic or lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, and BHD is Bert Hogg Dubé, which as a junior resident, probably you shouldn't even mention, but it's just another cause of cystic lung disease, often associated with benign skin lesions such as fibro folliculomas and also renal cell carcinoma. Pulmonary Langerhans histiocytosis is associated in, uh, with smokers, and uh, these cysts or cavities are often sparing the costophrenic angles inferiorly, and they're often irregular uh, in shape, thick-walled, and they arise from nodules, which are earlier findings in Langerhans cell histiocytosis. LAM, in contrast, occurs in women of childbearing age. The cysts are thin-walled, typically more uniform in shape and diffuse. And in lymphocytic or lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, the cysts are fewer but can be larger. They're often perivascular, and there can be amyloid deposits in the wall of these cysts. Berthog Dubé, the cysts tend to be larger and they favor the medial basal segments of the lower lung zones. And here are some examples. So it's important to have an approach to description of cystic lung disease, but before you go down that pathway, make sure you're looking at a case of cystic lung disease and not emphysema. In this patient with COPD, we can see some paraseptal emphysema here in the upper lung zones. And notice how these do not appear as well-defined cysts, although sometimes you can see thickening of the interlobular septa around areas of paraseptal emphysema, but the wall uh, in this particular case is not clearly defined, favoring paraseptal Septal emphysema rather than cysts. Notice also some centrilobular emphysema, um, very typically here in the posterior right upper lobe, as well as some pan acinar emphysema here in the superior segment left lower lobe. So this is a typical case of LAM, thin wall, diffuse, uh, very uniform cysts. It's important to describe, do you see few versus many cysts? Um, their size range, distribution, very important, as well as size. And what do the walls look like? Are they thin versus thick or irregular? 
This is an example of honeycomb cysts associated with usual interstitial pneumonia pattern of lung fibrosis. And let's move on to reticulation. So this is a case of peripheral reticulation, also what we call subpleural sparing, where the immediate periphery of the lungs does not, as, does not appear as severely involved. Notice some traction bronchiectasis, which is a clue that there is a fibrotic, fibrotic process at play. And this is a more severe example of some ground glass density and reticulation associated with more severe traction bronchiectasis in the right middle and lower lung zones. So for junior residents, this may not be uh, an easy question, but just give it a shot. Subpleural sparing pattern of reticulation is associated with which of the following? I'll give you a few moments. So this is a feature of nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, and you'll hear more about this in the upcoming lectures. So a few more facts about um, honeycomb cysts. They can be single layer uh, as they develop and then progress to multi-row uh, of cysts as the fibrosis progresses. And they're often seen with this apical basal gradient um, because that is the distribution of the fibrosis in usual interstitial pneumonia. And we see them because of increasing lung destruction with these fibrotic interstitial um, diseases where we get complete loss of the acinar structure resulting in these honeycomb cysts. Another uh, sign that you might hear about is the straight edge sign and that suggests that when you're dealing with a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern of fibrosis it's more likely to be secondary to underlying connective tissue disease rather than idiopathic i.e. IPF and here's an example. So let's test your knowledge. What is the name of the pattern or sign demonstrated here? I'll give you a few moments. So as mentioned, this is the apical basal gradient distribution or pattern, and these are honeycomb cysts in a case of UIP. In contrast, paraseptal emphysema is going to be upper lung zone predominant in single rows, whereas honeycomb cysts can be single rows as they develop and then progress to be stacked in multiple rows. And honeycomb cysts are going to be in the lower lung zones predominantly because that is the distribution of fibrosis in UIP. And if you have prior images to compare to, honeycomb cysts can get bigger and increased in number over time, whereas that's typically not a feature of paraseptal emphysema. So those uh, tips can help you differentiate honeycomb cysts from paraseptal emphysema. Because as you know, smoking is often uh, seen in these older male patients with UIP pattern fibrosis, and there's um, often overlapping paraseptal emphysema as well as honeycomb cysts in a patient with both emphysema and uh, pulmonary fibrosis in UIP pattern. So to compare and contrast these three conditions together, this is a case of chronic HP, uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, and usual interstitial pneumonia. And there are features or sort of buzzwords that go with each of these, which I demonstrate here. And notice in this case of NSIP, there's some beating of the airways telling you that there is fibrosis present here and not just simply ground glass opacity. So in chronic HP, you might hear of the term head cheese that reflects the three densities that we often see, gas trap lung causing the more lucent lung, normal lung density, as well as increased lung density. And uh, according to new guidelines, we're supposed to use a three density sign, although I still like the head cheese um, descriptor because it's so visual and easy to remember. And then lastly, nodules, and we're gonna focus on small nodules, not cavitary nodules and not big ones. Randomly distributed nodules don't have a specific pattern. They're kind of everywhere. Metastatic disease is going to be a very common underlying cause. When random nodules are very small, one to three millimeters, we use the term miliary. And here's an example of miliary TB. Notice how there are a couple of nodules here along the fissures, but the predominant pattern is a randomly distributed 
micronodular miliary pattern. And then centrilobular pattern is also an important distribution to recognize. They may be associated with tree and bud nodularity here. And that's an important thing to recognize because it takes you down a bronchiolar process pathway, usually infectious and inflammatory causes. Centrilobular nodules, as this example on the right-hand side, uh, can also demonstrate some ill-defined haziness without tree and bud nodularity, and that's often a feature seen in hypersensitivity pneumonitis in the acute or subacute phase, and also in the inhalational smoking-related interstitial lung diseases, such as re respiratory bronchiolitis and respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. Typically, the centrilobular nodules spare the visceral pleural surface. You can see here, they're a few millimeters away, and they often are evenly distributed when diffuse. Perilymphatic nodules, in contrast, are found along the pleural surfaces, along the fissures, as you can see here, and notice how we have nodules studying the airways. This is a very common distribution for sarcoidosis. And to differentiate sarcoid from lymphangitic carcinomatosis, I often look at the adenopathy, which tend to be symmetric in sarcoid and can be quite asymmetric in lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Often in lymphangitic carcinomatosis, we have other signs of metastatic disease. And in sarcoidosis, sometimes the granulomas coalesce to form the galaxy sign, similar to stars in a galaxy. So what is the distribution of these nodules? I'll give you a few moments. So these are ill-defined centrilobular nodules. Again, notice how they spare the visceral pleural surface. They're a few millimeters away, and often they are evenly spaced when they occur in the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule. So this is a roadmap to navigate small nodules, and for junior residents, don't worry about that for now. Just focus on recognizing the distribution of small lung nodules, but as you build on the knowledge that you have, you'll be able to recognize things like tree and bud, which takes you down a bronchiolar process, and then uh, recognize that other conditions such as endovascular metastases can also give you centrilobular nodules. You'll recognize the nuances of distribution, such as in sarcoidosis, which tends to be more mid and upper lung zone predominant, and the fact that when some nodules in the centrilobular distribution are very ill-defined and hazy, that's often a feature of HP or RB, RB, ILD. So I promised you five guiding principles. Here they are. Remember to use the term ground glass opacity correctly. So it's increased lung attenuation that does not obscure the vascular anatomy in contrast to consolidation, which does. And try to look for air trapping because it can help you narrow the differential diagnosis. Start by focusing on areas of more lucent lung and ask yourself if the blood vessels are fewer and smaller. That could be an indication that mosaic perfusion is present and the underlying condition can be an airway abnormality leading to reflex vasoconstriction and reduced vascular density. Of course, chronic PE would be another cause of mosaic perfusion. And expiration scanning is extremely helpful to confirm air trapping. You may have to bring the patient back to do this expiration scanning. Often it's done with non-contiguous low radiation dose technique. Um, and this can be extremely useful to uh, confirm your diagnosis or at least narrow the differential diagnosis. Look for uh, traction bronchiectasis because it can be a sign that a fibrotic interstitial lung disease is present. And lastly, for small nodules, centrilobular nodule distribution typically spare the visceral pleural surfaces. They're a few millimeters away. In contrast, perilymphatic uh, lung nodules are along the pleural surfaces, along the fissures, as well as the bronchovascular structures. So I know that looking at a chest CT of interstitial lung disease can be intimidating at first, but I know you can do it. And hopefully with the uh, approach that I've presented here, you will have increased confidence to do so. With that, I thank you so much for your attention. I wish you all the best of health and happiness in 2021. Bye for now.